Okay, I think we can work with that. Okay, y'all, thanks for all the input. Thanks for working with us here. Um, this is going to be our second iteration of the pruning section of our new series, uh, Bates Nursery Botanical Boot Camp. Um, and it's going to be good today. We're going to do a little hands on, a little less slideshow sitting in the room. So, um, and I should be mic, so it should make it a little easier for y'all to hear me. So today we're going to talk about tools. Um, as I said in the last one, I'm probably going to stay away from things like chainsaws. Uh, we will touch on power tools like, like power shears um, just to address that. Uh, so let's just go ahead and jump into tools. Um, I have some things that we offer here at Bates Nursery um, and there's a, a huge market for tools out there. You can spend as much as you could possibly think, um, but entry level, uh, there's no problem in starting with a, a cheaper, easier tool. Um, as long as you maintain it, that thing can last you for a long time. Uh, so we're gonna start with the smallest to the largest. Um, first thing is gonna be scissors. Um, so scissors are good for uh, pruning flowers, um, any real small cuts that you can't get to uh, with, with large hand pruners, um, as well as bonsai kind of brought one we got in today. Um, with bonsai, sometimes you just can't get a big pruner in to do some of these smaller cuts, uh, and a nice sharp pair of scissors uh, can really go a long way. Uh, next is gonna be hand pruners. And so there's all variety of hand pruners, uh, everything from a small scissor snip uh, to, a, to a bypass pruner. Um, the difference in these is basically gonna be the, the size of a cut that you can handle. Um, a small uh, pair of pruners like this, uh, you could easily do boxwood um, with all these smaller cuts. Uh, generally, once you get to the size of a pencil or larger, generally an eighth of an inch, you're gonna to wanna to move to something bigger, um, like a, a, a Corona pruner or something like that. Um, and I'll just mention, I do have some of my own tools up here. Um, you can definitely search all over for a really good, long lasting pruner that you can sharpen and maintain and replace parts. And that's really gonna be the big difference is replaceable parts, sharpenable blades. Um, that being said, a lot of these pruners, if you maintain them, sharpen them, um, they should give you years of service. Uh, and just another note about that, um, just knowing what you're cutting with can really lengthen the term of your pruners. Um, so cutting things like metal wire can really dent your pruner blade um, and cause issues down the line. Um, so after pruners, I'm gonna get into what we call shears typically, uh, scissor shears, and there's all types. Uh, here at Bates, we sell kind of a simple one. A lot of these have extendable handles. Uh, these will run probably $30 to $40. Um, and again, you can really maintain and sharpen this edge. Um, and you can get a very long time out of these pruners, um, keeping them in a, a dry place so they don't rust. Uh, and these are mostly going to be for shaping small cuts, again, below the size of a pencil uh, on more of a large scale. And I'll just go ahead and show you. We'll do some demonstrating with these. Um, so this is just more of a... Uh, lightweight, replaceable blade pruner. Um, you can get these from places like Japan and such, uh, but that's really not necessary. You don't need to spend $120 on a pair of pruners uh, to get the job done. Uh, now, once you get into a commercial setting with, with lots of repetitive cutting, this is really gonna save on your, your arms and your hands getting worn out. Uh, so the next one up we have are loppers. Um, and, and there's all grades of loppers, like these are going to run around $18.99 um, for a real basic pair of loppers. Um, you're generally going to do things up to an inch with these. They say up to like an inch and three quarters. Um, that's really going to be more trying on you physically with something like this. Uh, so we do offer more of a, a compound pruner um, with an assisting joint in there, you can see. Um, and these are just gonna give you a lot more leverage for, for much bigger cuts. Um, and just know the bigger cut you get into, the more uh, damage, let's say, you can do to a plant. So um, bigger is not always gonna be better for this, um, but keeping your tools sharp will make it to where your cuts are clean and not damaging the plant. Uh, and, and on the same um, line as loppers, this can be used for the same thing, or, or tree saws or hand saws. Um, 
this one's 1999 that's probably about an average cost for these i brought one from home and so there's all varieties um, these can be very very sharp tools so definitely be careful around them um, and these are great for cuts uh, an inch and a half and bigger uh, this is specced at three and a half inches um, really two three four inch cuts you can definitely do on a larger branch um, then again, most of the pruning I don't recommend with these right now. I'll probably wait till it cools down a little bit. Um, and I do have a rule of thumb for today, and that's based on sterilization. Um, this is something that's overlooked a lot uh, with our hand tools. Um, and sterilizer is basically there to, to kill any bacteria, any fungal pathogens or disease that a plant may be carrying when you're cutting it and keep it from transferring from cut to cut. Um, this is really kind of a big deal when we're looking at multiple landscapes or an entire lot like we have here. Um, but in your own home, if you have anything that has a, a possible disease, leaf spot, any issues with the plant, it's a good idea to sterilize before and after you cut that plant. Um, generally before you move on to a healthy plant is a good practice. Um, and that's usually what I call clean and sharp is a good way to, to practice with your tools. Um, so sanitize and sharpen uh, before you get going on a, a day of pruning. Um, so I brought a couple of sterilization products and most people are familiar with these right now. Um, Lysol, uh, bleach wipes, a lot of times a mixture of uh, like 10% of bleach to water mixture or just isopropyl alcohol. Um, you can carry a bucket around to dip these into. I kind of like the spray because you can just spray your tool down, um, wipe it off, and you're kind of good to go. Um, all these are doing are killing um, biological pathogens, and so we're just cleaning these tools to keep it from spreading to the next plant. Uh, and then the other part is sharpening. Um, so we do sell sharpening tools at Bates. These are great multi-purpose tools um, that you can use for any single edge blade, um, which is just about all of these tools. Um, this sharpening tool can last you for a decade uh, with, with moderate use. Um, and I can go ahead and show y'all um, how we're gonna sharpen these tools basically. Um, when we were waiting, I was kind of sharpening my hand pruners and I'll go ahead and show y'all just the basics how we're gonna use this tool. Um, this is a carbide sharpening tool, so it does have a little carbide end, I don't know if y'all can see it there, um, but this is the surface we're gonna hold to our blade um, to try to keep its bevel and keep its sharpness. Um, so you'll open your pruners and being very careful with a sharp, sharp blade. Um, and we're gonna run this from the base of the pruner to the tip, um, trying to keep that bevel um, that's already existing on that pruner. Generally, I'll do this four to seven times. I try not to be excessive uh, to wear the blade. So um, I'll put the tool to the blade and just give it some force and go with that curve. And four or five times should be enough to make this thing uh, substantially sharp. Uh, same thing with the shears. Um, so here's a pair of uh, scissor shears. So we can open that. We have two blades. So when you do this with each side, and you're gonna take this tool again with the carbide side facing the blade, and we're gonna run it from the base to the tip of that blade, counting the number of times. So I'm gonna go five times. And then we wanna make sure we do the same on the opposite blade. Um, this is important because if we don't sharpen both sides equally, we can end up with an uneven wear pattern and that can start uh, affecting the cuts. And I see someone's asking about the best product to clean the blades. Really, any sterilizing agent, um, probably the most classic is isopropyl alcohol. Um, you can literally dip these tools straight into alcohol. Uh, should dry fast to reduce rust. And then you can either wipe it off the blades or just let them air dry. Um, but alcohol is probably the simplest. Um, again, you can do uh, like a, a one to 10 parts of bleach to water uh, or a Lysol. Anything that's a disinfectant should work fine. Just wipe it off the blade before you get cutting again. Uh, and I do want to just make a note of, of why we're doing this sharpening. Um, one, when you cut these plants, it's going to make it look a lot better. It's going to reduce uh, rough ends that we get from a dull blade. Um, it's just going to keep it cleaner, greener, uh, keep it healthier. So uh, the, the sharper a blade is, the less 
um, wound we're going to have for pathogens to enter. Uh, and then we're also going to get a longer life out of these tools if we sharpen them. Uh, maintenance is really going to let these tools last. And I am going to touch on power tools real quick. Um, I did bring just a simple electric shear. A lot of people are very familiar with this. Um, these electric or power shears are, are great tools for large hedges. Um, personally, I do think they get a little overused in the landscape. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do with our shears or pruners that this just makes a more aggressive cut on. So um, these are great for smaller leaf plants, uh, such as boxwood, juniper, uh, things that have a very small fine leaf, because um, this cut won't show. Uh, however, on hollies, laurels, things with a bigger leaf, um, this can leave unsightly cuts in those leaves, which is also a bigger wound. So um, power shears are a great tool. Um, again, sanitizing that blade is going to be important, especially if you're doing a, a plant with pathogens. Um, but this should be used sparingly on all plants, but it definitely has its place. Um, now we're going to get into a little more specifics on pruning. Um, like we did the last lecture, right now in the summertime, deadheading is really going to be, um, yeah, actually I'll, I'll address that. Someone asked about the electric shears. That is one of the downsides with those electric shears is they are very difficult to sharpen. Um, they have two blades on each of those prongs and you need to sharpen every one of those blades. Um, so it, it's quite a process and that's another reason I don't like using it excessively because um, sharpening that tool can take upwards of 30 minutes to do it properly. So um, th that's another drawback to the power tools is sharpening can be uh, uh, very time consuming, but it still should be done. A lot of times we'll do that with a carbide blade or a simple file. Uh, that we'd use on any, like a lawnmower blade. Um, so we're gonna get back to pruning. Deadheading is something that's really gonna be big this time of year. Um, I don't have any perennials up here, but I can give you an example on a rose. So this is a climbing rose, uh, Joseph's coat, you may be familiar with. Um, so here is a bloom um, that's starting to kind of get through its, its season of, of color. Um, there are, however, two blooms behind this, so it's up to you whether you want to cut this to make the plant manicured or leave it. Personally, I'd probably leave the one with the buds. Um, here's more up here that are more spent. So we'll call this a dead bloom, and what we're going to do is come down on that bloom until we hit uh, a row of five leaves. Now this one's a little difficult to tell, but we're not going to hit five leaves until we get down to this junction. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and prune it back here. We'll kind of pull this out here. Um, but you can see those dead blooms. That's the point when I would start looking at cutting it back. If you're just deadheading, you can easily go just below where those blooms were and snip it off. And with perennials, this is even easier. Um, just take those blooms as far down to that plant to where you can't see them. Um, and then you should get another set depending on what plant we're pruning. And the next thing I was gonna go into was actually roses. So this is perfect. Um, this is a climbing rose. Um, so you can still do deadheading and maintenance on it. Um, however, I usually let these climb um, until we've kind of gotten the cane mass and the length that we want. And then we can start thinning it and pruning it back. I'll grab another rose here. This is easy on the eyes. And you can see this thing puts on large bloom clusters. Um, if you can see this plant overall, it's starting to get a little unwieldy. Um, and these blooms are just about spent. So on a plant like this, I would usually try to keep the shape of this, this rose while I'm pruning. Um, so I'll take a lot of these big canes and prune them back. And, and as long as we're pruning back to right above a leaf, uh, we should get good growth on this rose. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this in. Um, and you've got something you can stick in a vase right there and get blooms for here over the next week or so. Uh, but it's totally okay to prune this back on a rose. I probably wouldn't go much bigger than this size cut at this point of the year. And let me go ahead and cut a couple more of these off and show y'all how I would kind of shape this rose back up. 
Now, I don't recommend pruning this hard on a lot of plants right now. Um, roses are pretty resilient to cutting, so um, I, I wouldn't be afraid to do this. But if you see this rose now, I've cut off some of these big canes, and now it's got a little more of a shape to it. Um, it's going to start throwing on new buds. You can see where it's growing um, tighter into the plant. So we're just going to get a better looking plant for our late summer fall blooms. Um, you can definitely fertilize a rose in the summer. Um, just know the more you, you deadhead these blooms, the more vigorous growth you're going to get later in the year. And there's a lot uh, you can get into with rose pruning. That's just the basics. Um, heavy cutbacks are really important to a rose the following year. I would wait to do that until the leaves fall off of that plant. Um, and we can talk about that later, but basically we're just gonna cut that rose all the way to about six inches from the ground uh, every fall or winter. I also wanna talk about crepe myrtles because that's a really popular tree uh, to talk about right now. And I believe I do have one. So here's a crepe myrtle. It definitely does have a nice tree shape right now, but I do want to uh, point out we have something we call suckers at the bottom, which is really common. Um, these are basically just shoots of this plant coming up from the root system. Um, so it's really easy to do, and you can do this any time of year. If you have suckers and you don't want a, a low bushing crepe myrtle, just come in either with your fingers, which is really easy to do, or with a pair of pruners and just prune those suckers off right at the ground. And this won't hurt the crepe myrtle. In fact, it'll throw its growth vertical and try to get its energy where you want it. Um, we can also do uh, limbing up of this crepe myrtle. This one's pretty clean, um, but what we're talking about is trying to keep our canopy up high and keep our uh, trunk clear down towards the bottom. So you can start as this thing grows, um, pruning off lower branches and you'll start to get more of this trunk canopy look. Um, you can definitely do that this time of year. Just know if it hasn't bloomed, you might be cutting off your blooms, um, as well as keeping our cutting underneath 30% of the plant just to reduce stress in summer. So um, a little bit of pruning is great on these, um, but keep it under 30% and mostly suckers is, is really gonna help you out. And also keep this crepe myrtle from being stressed uh, before going dormant. Uh, I did mention last time, uh, this one really doesn't have this issue. Uh, however, some of the crepe myrtles this past year that, that burned back will have uh, brown growth up top. Um, you can definitely cut that off uh, right now because it's dead growth. So if you have brown branches on the tips of your crepe myrtle that are unsightly, feel free to prune those off just to make it look better. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about evergreens. Um, we do have a boxwood up here. And I kind of picked one that's got a little bit of a, a shag going on here. So this would be a perfect time to shear this boxwood. Um, I do like to try to, to get into the spring and fall season. Um, however, summer pruning is fine as long as it's not bigger than the size of a pencil for these. So um, this would be fine. And I'll just do a quick shear on this guy. So this would be where I start using shears, uh, boxwood, juniper and literally putting these shears up there and finding a little bit of a shape where I want it. And giving it a cut. And, and you couldn't hear uh, those shears cutting too much, which is a good thing. Uh, nice and sharp means it shouldn't be very noisy. Um, so you can see we're starting to get a little more of a round shape to that boxwood. Uh, this will make it bush out a little more rounded. Uh, you could definitely do this probably three, maybe four times a year. I wouldn't do it too excessively. Um, one more evergreen. I'll just kind of talk about with y'all. Um, so here is a topiary juniper. It's maybe a little difficult for y'all to see, um, but this one's definitely been sheared. Uh, it's gonna be the same practice. So when we have maybe two to three inches of growth on these, we can shear these to kind of get them shaped. Um, it's definitely a little bit of an art form uh, and it's something you should definitely take your time enjoying to do. Um, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but with boxwoods junipers, they're really forgiving. Um, and it's a great way to start um, into the topiary um, section of landscaping uh, and shaping your plants. Uh, last thing we're going to talk about is vines. Um, 
And we did talk about ground cover vines, but I'm going to talk more about vines on trellises because uh, you can definitely maintain those. Uh, this is a pyracantha, um, which is usually grown for its winter berries. So just know if you prune anything off this plant, you might be pruning your fruit off. Um, so this is pyracantha, uh, and you can see how this is on a columnar trellis. Uh, what I would do with something like this is use hand pruners to kind of bring it into the trellis a little bit and get it to fill out. Um, so with pyracantha, these do have thorns. Um, I would take these branches that are coming out and cut them into the plant to where we kind of hide our cut. And same thing with something that's trained on a fence. I would just go ahead and trim around that plant and pull it into that fence. And you'll probably have to do this more than a lot of other plants for maintenance. Um, I usually let my vines get about two foot of growth before I go in and start cutting back. Generally, this can be done anytime. Again, just be cognizant of fruit. Uh, and one more evergreen, sorry, I almost forgot about this, y'all, is the laurel. Uh, most people are very familiar with this plant. Uh, and this is one plant I get a lot of questions about uh, pruning. And I kind of picked one that has a little bit of uh, excessive growth and unruliness to it. Um, you can use shears and power shears on these. However, I really don't recommend it. With these big leaves, you're gonna make big cuts in that plant. So um, if you can do this with hand pruners, uh, you'll get a much more beautiful plant in the end. So. And I'll show y'all how to sanitize. I don't have a bucket of water, but with the Lysol, uh, it's really gonna be as easy as spraying these down. I'll go ahead and do it on a pair that I'm not using on this plant. So on the scissor shears, I would easily just spray this with a, a Lysol um, or even a Clorox product and just go ahead and spray these. Use them a few times to get that um, disinfectant on the blades and then either let them sit for a few minutes or wipe them off with a towel. Okay, so for the little, um, generally I'm gonna try to use hand pruners on these to get a level look instead of shearing them hard. Um, so these excessive branches, I usually will take this branch that's the tallest and try to follow that into the plant on uh, the next big intersection. So I'll go on in there, snip that branch, uh, and this is what we're getting out of that. And I'll do that a couple more times with these larger branches. And my goal here is to give this plant somewhat of a level look without having to put a bunch of big cuts into the, the plant. Okay, and this is probably a lot easier on a big landscape plant than here in a small potted plant. Um, but you can see I've kind of had a general flat surface on this laurel. Um, this allows it to stay soft, not excessively dense, and reduces the amount of cuts we're doing on these leaves just to give it a much more beautiful appearance, uh, especially from close up. This will also tend to reduce the spread of shot hole fungus uh, as we do have a more airy plant here. Uh, you could easily keep it under your, your kitchen window uh, with this process a few times a year. Uh, and that's pretty much what I have planned for you all today. Um, and I've been kind of trying to answer your questions as we go just to address them. Um, but now we're going to open this up to questions through text. And I think we already have a few in front of us to address and, and we'll kind of go from there. And if you do ask questions, try to make sure you're responding to the everyone channel uh, and not just a Norma Gary. Um, that way everyone can see what we're responding to. Um, we did get a couple of questions from Billy Butterworth. Um, and, and I think we did address these questions. Um, one was for sharpening pruners and loppers. Definitely, you can do that at home. All you need is a carbide uh, blade sharpener. Super easy. Um, uh, super easy and um, something you should definitely consider doing in your own home. Uh, as well as the power hedge trimmer question from Mr. Butterworth. Um, 
as I said, power trimmers um, can do a lot of damage in a quick amount of time. So just know um, to use those sparingly on plants that have small leaves, so like boxwood, juniper, things like that, where the cuts won't be so obvious. And then hand tools I recommend for things with large leaves, like hollies, um, laurels, things such as that, just because it won't be so noticeable, it'll give you a healthier plant. Um, someone did also ask about sandpaper to sharpen smaller tools. I imagine you could use an emery cloth um, or maybe a sandpaper. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because those are not made for tools. So usually a carbide surface or even a, a, a wetting stone can be used. Um, again, these carbide blades, uh, we sell them for $12.99. That's about an average price. Um, really a great investment and this will do just about all of your hand tools. Um, I have a question about um, trimming on boxwood and getting some brown spots. Um, the brown spots could be several things. Um, it could be pruning during a heat stress time for the plant. Uh, it could also have been a, a pruner that was a little bit dull or an electric trimmer basically will, will rub those leaves when it works. Um, with those brown cuts, I would probably actually use a hand pruner. So like this boxwood, I would use a hand pruner to go in and prune out that clump of leaves that has turned brown. If you can select that clump of leaves that's brown and cut it, we'll call that end of the plant a little bit, um, that should fill in with fresh green foliage. That's gonna get rid of that brown the quickest. Uh, someone asked when they should prune crepe myrtles. I would recommend when all the leaves have fallen off or right after you're getting blooms on that. So most crepe myrtles are midway through bloom season, probably another month or two um, or until those leaves fall off is ideal um, for pruning over the winter, fine. Um, spring, you can do early spring. I wouldn't wait until late spring, summer or else you could lose your blooms for the year. Um, we have a couple questions about fruit. Um, so fruit vines like blackberries, um, I think I did mention this a little bit on Tuesday, uh, but those fruit vines really you should do that before they flower by about four or five months, which typically is going to be right after you harvest the fruit. Uh, so on these vines, I would probably do it um, here in the next three months, but deeper into the fall um, or winter time, you should be just fine pruning these vines. And with figs, it's going to be the same thing. So um, wintertime pruning on figs, we really want to avoid those figs, which aren't always cold hardy here, uh, to put excessive growth on before frost. So wait till the leaves have fall off, fallen off uh, past the final frost of the year or, or after our, our frost for fall. Um, and then I would cut my figs back. Um, it really doesn't matter too much on figs where you cut them. Um, just know if, if you cut off branching, each branch is going to hold fruit, so the more that you cut off auxiliary branches, the less fruit you're going to get. Um, there's a question about shaping a Japanese maple. Um, this is kind of a tough question to answer because Japanese maples are um, very varied in their habit. With Japanese maples, I usually recommend as little pruning as possible, if not no pruning at all. Um, if you do need to prune, I recommend doing hand pruners. If you shear these Japanese maples, it could lose its natural habit and become more formal. Um, so uh, with Japanese maples, hand pruners, I would definitely wait um, until the leaves have fall off, fell, fallen off on a Japanese maple. However, they don't bloom. So any time of the year where it's not stressed out, you can essentially prune um, but I would leave that pruning on a Japanese maple uh, well under 15% at a time. Uh, just because they're so sensitive, this goes along with not excessively fertilizing Japanese maples. Um, this can cause excessive growth and the need for more pruning. Um, so just kind of let them do their thing. And then uh, once you get into winter time, you can do some shaping of that tree. Um, to me, less is more on a Japanese maple. Um, so I think that I have addressed most all the questions in front of me. I'll, I'll wait for another minute or two um, to see if anyone else has any questions. Just let y'all know these are already dry from spraying them with a disinfectant. So 
Um, you'd be good to go if you wipe these with a, a rag afterwards. It can get rid of a lot of the sap buildup that you have. So you kind of get a double duty out of that uh, sanitizer. Uh, so we do have a couple questions. Uh, Leyland cypress with canker disease. Um, I really don't recommend pruning Leyland cypress. However, if you do have cankers um, and you can visibly see those active fungal growths, you do want to cut those off. Um, but if you are touching those cankers with tools or anything, you very much need to sterilize those. Um, it's really going to be a matter of treating that tree as a whole with a fungicide with cankers um, versus pruning it off. I, I don't know how much um, ahead you're going to get of that disease with just hand pruning. Um, that whole tree probably needs to be treated with a fungicide. Uh, someone asked about storing tools in sand. Um, I'm sure you could. I think any sort of low humidity environment, um, like in your house or in a shed, would be ideal. The downside with sand is um, some sand can have a grit, and if that gets stuck between your blades uh, before you go to, to use it, um, it can create pitting in that blade. So I wouldn't necessarily have any sand on my blade before using it. Um, I'm sure you could store them in sand. I don't know that it has any benefits. Uh, and then uh, leggy shrubs like an Akuba, um, real similar to this laurel. Um, if you can wait until fall when this plant has less stress and it's going to be growing more. But like with an Akuba, I would take those branches that are on a hole leaning over or looking unsh unshapely and prune those within the canopy of the tree so that we hide our cut. Um, and we don't see it anymore. And I did touch on roses. Um, the big thing with roses is gonna be cutting back to at least um, a leaf with a five count. Um, this will allow that plant to throw growth into a new bloom. Sometimes if you only cut it back to three leaves, uh, it may not be as ready to throw uh, new blooms on. Uh, as well as with climbing roses, um, once you have all your, your growth for the year and all the leaves have fallen off, you can thin the canes down to maybe two or three on a climbing rose, and then you can use those as your main canes that blooms are going to come off of. Um, as well as a wintertime hard cut on roses is really important. I wouldn't do that right now. Um, that's typically going to be done with a lopper. Um, and, and go ahead and cut those back. Um, almost six inches from the ground, um, but in winter time. All right, y'all. Um, you can definitely still submit questions after we're done, um, and we would love to see you in Bates Nursery. Uh, I'm Ben Trest. Uh, we have several other guys who are great at what they do, uh, and if you have any questions or pictures you'd like us to look at, um, we'd be more than happy to help you in person, um, as well as you can call or email us. Um, again, I I'm Ben with Bates Nursery. Um, this was on hands-on tools and pruning, and thank you all so much for working with us. Um, there'll definitely be more to come. Thank you.